Ja, herzlich willkommen zu unserem Panel. Very well, welcome to all of you to our webinar that is dedicated to new genetic engineering techniques. This is not the first event and it is not going to be the last. I'm not only a member of the Euro Parliament, but I'm also a farmer and I focus on biological or organic farming. And I will draw the conclusions at the end. But first of all, let me tell you the following. I don't believe that these techniques are as non-damaging as the Commission is trying to make us believe. Actually, they're following the American approach, and this is not acceptable. Therefore, we have to persuade the Commission to proceed in a different way. So enjoy the webinar. Dilly. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Francisca, for giving me the floor, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, happy to be to be with you. So the starting point uh, for our discussion today is, as it is al already said by Martin, is a recent statement by the Commission in which it says that the current EU um, GMO legislation is not fit for purpose for some GM uh, technologies and their products. Um, based on that analysis, now what is the Commission saying? The Commission has suggested that certain GM plants should be excluded from the EU GMO legislation and that they could lead to more sustainable agriculture. They should be regulated differently and not go through the EU GMO authorization process and not be traceable and labeled as GMOs. What are these GMO plants that are supposed to be exempt now from the EU GMO legislation? Broadly speaking, these are GM plants that have no foreign DNA added to their genome. This includes plants that have been engineered with a new GM technology called gene editing, but it also includes plants that have been engineered with the older GM technology and where genetic material has been added from a sexually compatible crossable uh, species, so-called cisgenic plants. From the Greens' point of view, taking all this out of uh, EU GMO legislation would be a massive change and a change that undermines the very foundation of the EU GMO legislation. Why do we think this is incompatible with our EU legislation and the precautionary principle? The European Court of Justice has ruled that organisms engineered with GM technology that has emerged or has been mainly developed since 2001 must be regulated under EU GMO legislation. The European Court of Justice has argued that anything else would defeat the purpose of this legislation, namely to protect people and the environment from unforeseen outcomes of novel technology that modifies the genetic material of an organism in a way that does not occur naturally. The point is, we are talking about new technology and potential risks are unknown. It is not tried and tested and does not have a long safety record. This is why the EU GMO legislation must apply. Now, the Commission has now turned this logic upside down by saying that the products of some technological methods that we have no experience with and don't exactly know which risk it may bring should absolutely not be regulated under our GMO legislation, which is made for exactly this purpose. So far, we don't know what the Commission has in mind when it says we want to make new rules or adapt the existing ones for uh, the GM plants that it wants to exclude from the existing rules, contrary so to the court's ruling. Still, we felt it would be good to discuss what the possible future could look like in which the EU requirements for GMO market authorization risk assessment, traceability, and labeling are no longer in place. What could be the outcome for farmers, consumers, for the environment? 
that's what we want to discuss and to hear from you. So looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tilly. Thank you very much for that introduction and, and already you know, an explanation of the Greens' point of view. Uh, now let me introduce our first speaker today, Irene Sacristan-Sanchez from the European Commission. Welcome, Irene. Thanks for joining us. Um, and hello to a few streets down in Brussels, <laughs> because we're, we're all in Brussels here. Some others will be joining us, uh, uh, are joining us from much further away. Uh, Irene, you are the head of the biotechnology unit at the Director General for Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. You took up that post in February this year. Uh, you've been working with the European Commission for a long time. Uh, before joining the Directorate General for Health and Food Safety, you worked in the Directorate General for Enterprise and Industry in the Pharmaceuticals Unit. Irene is an economist and lawyer by education and holds a Master of European Legal Studies from the College of Europe. So Irene or Ms. Sacristan, um, what is it that the Commission has in mind here? What is next now that you have found that certain GM plans should be excluded from the EU GMO legislation, although the Court of Justice, the EU's highest court, has said they are and should be covered by that legislation? Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Francisca, honorable members. Uh, thank you for the invitation today. Let me just first get the technology working and see if I can share my screen. Hopefully this is working. It's working okay. Fine. We can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, indeed, I, let me just um, say a little bit about um, the study that we published at the end of April um, and, and how that study has uh, underpinned a bit the decision to announce a, a policy initiative in, in the area. And uh, I, I will try to be to be brief, but also to start addressing some of the of the issues that um, that have been uh, raised. Um, I mean, as you know, the study was a request uh, from the Council to the Commission, and the Council made that request uh, in the aftermath of the ruling of the Court of Justice on a new mutagenesis techniques. The Council acknowledged um, the clarity that uh, the ruling brought in, in terms of the legal status uh, of, uh, of new mutagenesis techniques. Um, but also considered that there's a number of aspects that needed to be investigated, uh, linked to implementation and, and impact on different sectors. So with this starting point, we have tried to do a study that would be as comprehensive as possible in, in bringing clarity about this technique. So we have looked not just at um, issues of the legal status, but also um, research, uh, ongoing research and applications being developed, safety issues, potential benefits, concerns, and, and so on. And we've also taken a very broad uh, scope uh, by looking at the use of these techniques in plants, in animals, in microorganisms, as well as in the agri-food, medicinal, and industrial sector. So we hoped with the study to provide a good basis uh, to think about future policy also in the context of current priorities uh, and uh, notably the green, the green Deal. I don't want to go now back in history to how we did it, but just to say um, that the study has um, strong technical contrib contributions from EFSA and from the Joint Research uh, Center, um, both of them in turn based in, in uh, extensive scientific literature. And we have built on the information and the scientific evidence available uh, from a number of, of uh, organizations at European uh, level. We have also tried to reflect stakeholder views, which, as you all know, in this, uh, in this area are quite polarized. And uh, we have invited all EU level uh, organizations in related fields, so impacted or interested in, in this field. And we hope we have also reflected those different voices. So 
what are the main findings? And I, I am not going in any way to attempt to be exhaustive. I will just choose a few things which I think will be the most relevant for the discussion today. I think one crucial issue is, is to look a little bit into what are we talking about when we talk of new genomic techniques. Uh, we use this as a sort of loose term for all those techniques that have developed in the last 20 years since we have our legislation. But what I think the study illustrates quite well, and this is very important to think in terms of, of what's the most suitable regulatory framework, is that the techniques are extremely diverse in themselves as techniques, but also that they can be used in very different ways to obtain very different uh, genetic modifications. So these techniques can be used to obtain transgenic products. That's the ones that we are mostly used to in, in the currently authorized uh, GMO. So with uh, genetic material from sexually incompatible uh, organisms. So something that doesn't happen in nature. And these techniques can be used all the way to producing um, uh, products uh, that would be very similar in the modification obtained to what can occur naturally or through conventional breeding. So this is a first important point to make this diversity um, in the techniques and, and the results. We've also looked, or rather the Joint Research Center has Bene, looked... Il centro per la ricerca congiunta ha anche... Hmm, I, I have Italian interpretation in my earphones for a moment, sorry. Um, we've, looked, um, we've looked a little bit at what's in the pipeline. There's very few products on the market, as, as you know, but the JRC has mapped what's coming. And here again, uh, I think there's an important, uh, there's an important uh, finding which is related to the diversity in the type of products targeted and the trades. And I just wanted to show you very quickly, focusing on the area of plants, the types of plants that are being, um, that are being researched uh, for uh, new genomic technique applications. And even more interesting, the type of traits that are being introduced. And as, as you will see, this goes well beyond the traits that are the most frequent uh, in, in, the current, uh, in the current GMOs that are authorized. When you look at these traits, uh, I think this shows uh, as well the potential of these techniques uh, by introducing this kind of traits in the context of the overall sustainability uh, agenda, because among the trades, uh, there's uh, plants that could be made more resistant to pest and disease or to climate conditions like extreme heat or rain. Um, there's traits that would relate to increasing nutritional content or reducing harmful content. And this is just speaking about plants. We, we refer also in, in some detail in the study to the potential applications in, in animals, uh, microorganisms, uh, and of course, in the pharmaceutical um, area. Uh, this is not to say that there are no concerns uh, out there. And I think we are going to focus in the discussion today a lot on, on some, of these, uh, some of these concerns raised by a number of stakeholders and uh, uh, member states. Um, and they relate to um, possible risks and the need to ensure uh, the safety of uh, human and animal health and the environment. Um, issues of coexistence with um, organic agriculture and also GM free agriculture. The issue of consumer information. How do we, we ensure that consumers have the information they need about uh, their products or in particular their, their food? Um, and also among, among those who, uh, who question uh, the potential of this product, there is a questioning also of whether um, these traits that are being investigated will, will be realized into concrete uh, benefits. Uh, so that we try to reflect both the potential and, and these concerns in, in the study. Just a couple of words uh, on the issue of safety, because this is such a, a, a crucial uh, issue um, and, and so central to, to the regulation of, of these products. Uh, 
the main conclusion on on safety i mean if we had to pick one i i think it would be linked again to the diversity of the technique so i think there is there is broad scientific consensus that the variety of the techniques and their possible uses calls for a case by case approach to identify potential risk and to determine the amount of data that is necessary for a for a proper assessment this this is a quite important uh, issue um, there is also another important finding, which is very much at the basis of, of the policy action now announced, um, which is the findings from, um, from EFSA and, and also from a considerable uh, number of, of scientific bodies that uh, plants and plant products obtained from certain techniques would have a safety profile that would be comparable to conventional breeding uh, and, and would not uh, would not have substantial differences in, in that regard. There's still a number of areas of uh, scientific gap where we need to build uh, more knowledge uh, and this uh, concerns in particular the uses in animals and microorganisms. That, that's an area where we need to, to continue work before any type of policy action could be considered. And then a final point on, on the findings of the study, which is also quite important, the implementation and the enforcement issues. This is, in the end, what was largely at the basis of, of the Council request. Uh, we have clarity on, uh, on the application of the current GMO legislation to these techniques, but we have some difficulties in the application. Some result uh, from legal uncertainty, how to apply it to techniques that have been developed since, um, and some relate to how to apply concrete detection requirements in situations where the differentiation of the products uh, is, is not uh, obvious. So this has led us to conclude, in, indeed, uh, as it was said in, in the introduction, that the legislation needs adaptation as regards certain products derived from NGDs, um, taking also into account that uh, we see certainly the potential to contribute to sustainability objectives, whereas today the current legal framework has no mechanism at all to take this uh, into account. I think it's very clear also, uh, and, and uh, I, I wish to underline it as well, that uh, the framework for NGTs should not be detrimental to other forms of agriculture and uh, these concerns in particular organic and, and GM free. And then finally, I already mentioned we have some knowledge gaps in areas like animals and microorganisms. Um, and then a final issue, I have not gone into that in, in the presentation, but um, uh, this is an area also where we need uh, to continue public discussion and to try to build uh, public awareness uh, for, a, for an open and, and informed debate. So indeed, as it has been said in the beginning, we have announced a policy action that covers a part of the products that can be derived from new genomic techniques. We are only uh, talking about plants and of uh, targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis uh, in terms of, of the modifications obtained. Um, we, are not, we are not announcing a deregulation which would simply take those products out of the current framework and without providing anything. Uh, the, the issue is to provide for a regulatory framework that is adapted to these products. Uh, that maintains and changed our objective of protection uh, of human and animal health and the environment so that uh, that maintains uh, our levels and expectation of, of safety at the same time that uh, it contains mechanisms that allows us to take into consideration potential contributions uh, to societal challenges this is something for example that's criticized today of the GMO legislation, uh, where we are sometimes told, well, you are authorizing products that do not necessarily contribute to objectives, but we have no basis to, to take that into account today. So that's, that's basically the initiative. Other organisms, uh, other new genomic techniques, we will not address. They continue uh, covered by the GMO legislation. 
Um, and the Commission will also take action in the area of medicinal products, but that will be tackled in the context of the pharmaceutical strategy. So I, I hope I have kept to my time. Um, and with this, uh, I will just say thank you very much. Thank you very much for this quite comprehensive presentation. Uh, I think that's given us a lot of information to discuss later on. Thank you so much. Uh, but we are a little bit over time, so we have to move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Angelika Hilbeck. Uh, welcome, Angelika. Uh, Hello. Angelika Hilbeck is a Swiss German agroecologist. She researches and teaches at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich in Switzerland. So I suppose you're joining us from Switzerland today. Yes. Um, her work focuses on the environmental effects of genetically modified plants in ecosystems. And Angelica is a co-founder of the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, ENSER, which brings together scientists from various disciplines. And Angelica and her, a few of her colleagues from ENSA have written a very interesting report for our group, for the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament, in which they take a careful look at the science of genetically modified organisms and gene edited organisms in particular, in response to an earlier report by the German Science Academy Leopoldina. And I think, Angelica, you're going to mention that as well. Angelica, I will be right. <laughs> what do you think about this idea that genetic engineering can contribute to more sustainable farming? Is it possible to use these new GM technologies, which the Commission calls new genomic techniques, um, to develop plants that are you know, hardier or can be grown with less chemicals and that are drought resistant, etc., from a scientific point of view? Uh, and also, if, if that is so, um, what do you think the likelihood is that that will actually happen in, in reality? Over to you. And that in 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And more. And more, yes. All right. Well, I will try to do my best. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and the presentation, introduction here. Um, I would, in order to answer your question, I would just dive into my presentation and then we can see if I, um, if I indeed answered what you were putting in front of me. I'm struggling a little bit to get my screen free of all kinds of stuff here that blocks my view on what I'm going to be saying. Do you see my um, presentation? Yeah. And you hear me well? Okay, good. Well, um, let's see. In the end, you can judge for yourself how likely it is that through these uh, interventions, we will be able to develop the kinds of products that we need for uh, a future sustainable agriculture. First, we need to get uh, sustainable agriculture. First, we need to agree that we actually want to transform our agricultural systems. That's the biggest block right now. And once we've done that, then we can look, you know, what technology or what support do we need in order to achieve those goals? All right. Um, I'd like to say uh, I speak in my capacity here as uh, ENSA right now, but I, of course, draw from my 30 years of experience in the midst of the debate about GMOs, transformation of agriculture, agroecology, etc. So why I say that is always also to... Uh, understand that the debate about the new technologies it did not fall from the sky just a couple of years ago. It is a continuation and it is an embedded and contextualized in a 30, 40 year of discourse about genetic and gene technological interventions in living organisms that are used uh, for agricultural purposes, mainly plants, but they tried also animals, of course, and uh, microorganisms, etc. So it's there is a there is a history to this. It's not decontextualized from a historic root. So we need to keep that in mind. Based on that, because that informs us as well in our position, we have come uh, to the understanding that these tools that are now promoted as, you know, and they try to give them fancy names in order to avoid the term gene, gene technology from editing to what have you, 
they add new genetic engineering tools. And they're cutting edge new genetic engineering tools. And in other fields like the medical fields or so, nobody would even attempt to uh, try to raise the impression they wouldn't be, they are. And they also knew that they, obviously, if you're new and you're pioneering, you don't have a history of safe use. They're recognized as a human-made, non-natural intervention and invention because they can be patented as a human-made engineering achievement to you know, reward the inventor with um, special rights on their invention. So they're not natural. You couldn't get that on any natural invention. And it is our position that as a tool, it has the potential to do both. It has the potential to do something good, something benign. And it has, of course, likewise, the potential of doing unwanted adverse effects. And what is benign and what is adverse is also contextual. What is benign in the eyes of a genetic engineer may not be perceived as something benign in the eyes of the wider parts of the society and vice versa. What is an unwanted adverse effect may not be shared by all segments of society either. So that's a fundamental normative aspect that can at best be informed by science, but is not to be solved by science. That's something we all have to do from various aspects. So both benign and adverse effects have to be studied in well-designed experiments in order to inform us with proper information and data. And when these techniques are applied to living organisms and released into the environment, their subsequent ecological and evolutionary behavior is certainly beyond human control. It takes on a dynamic and a nature of its own that we do not control. So consequently, this informs us to take the position that they must be regulated at least as stringently as products of other genetic engineering techniques or more, because the argument of adjusting it to the level of technology doesn't always have to naturally go in releasing them from oversight. But actually, you could make oversight more stringent and if a technology is promoted on being quicker, faster, and deeper, and more efficient, you could just as well argue that you should adjust your regulation to account for that depth and that breadth of its intervention potential and what it could cause on the side of the risks. So it should go both ways. If you only look in one way, you're looking biased, okay? We don't want to be biased, right? So the court was trying to um, address that, and they have perfectly right said, is spoken in the conditional and said risks linked to the use of these techniques might prove, they didn't say they are, they said they might prove to be similar to those for a result from the product and release of transgenesis. And they correctly pointed out that these techniques are possible to produce genetically modified varieties at a rate out of all proportion of those resulting from application of conventional methods. That is the very nature why they want to use them because they have that capacity. So that is a true statement, scientifically backed. And that makes it perfectly clear if, if uncertainty or if caution means anything to you, you ought to be looking both ways. You ought to not only look in one way. So these new genetic engineering techniques, the way why they are so much more potential is they can alter and delete many identical DNA sequences simultaneously. They can alter and delete many different DNA sequences simultaneously, so identical and also different ones called multiplexing. They can alter and delete DNA sequences in specifically protected regions of the genome. And this systematic fashion of deleting and changing identical sequences in many parts of the genome or different ones as well is fundamentally different from any untargeted and any, any mutagenesis techniques we've been using so far and certainly different from conventional breeding. That's why they want to use it. Otherwise, I would say use conventional breeding if they can achieve the same thing. Why bother? So they are different. Clearly, that's why they want to use them. They have more potential in the minds of an engineer. So that means um, what comes along with the safety is usually the narrative that precision, because the tool is like a scalpel, you can make very razor sharp interventions in the genome. That's where the precision comes from. And that automatically transforms or translates into control, which is limited only to the part that you want to change. So it's limited to the piece of DNA, the DNA sequence you want to change, what is known, 
That's where the focus is when you follow that position equals control narrative. The problem we have as ecologists, evolutionary biologists, and people with a bit broader perspective on, on the environment and, and, and what we do in agriculture, is that this position does not apply to the knowledge of the wider geno genomic context, like the gene functioning in relation to the environment and epigenetic regulatory networks. That is marginal or often not even existent. That by itself may not be bad if it's recognized, but the problem is that in the field of genetic engineers, that is not considered a necessary prerequisite to do it safely. It is as if you tell to a surgeon who has an intervention in the cardiovascular system with a very sharp, highly precise scalpel, but doesn't know, other than the piece he wants to remove, in what larger context that piece has been functioning. So obviously, there is a lot of uncertainty coming along with that if you don't have that knowledge that you must fully embrace and not marginalize and deny. And that's where we are getting into, into our problems and into the dis discussions about what role does scientific uncertainty play here and how important is it that we don't understand the context we're going to be intervening in. And this is just as an example. These are the kinds of contexts we're talking about, okay? That's a species interaction network just from a farm in England. It's just that you find different studies. I just highlight them with this because to illustrate the type and the complexity we're interfering with, who went through the pains and actually quantified the unique interactions between the various taxa they had there. And they found, you see the numbers yourself, 1,500 quantified interactions between a total of 560 taxa of different groups of animals, et cetera. They're all 100%, almost 100% linked. That means if you do something to one, it will happen and have an impact on the other. And this, this is a principle in nature. That's an ecological principle that you find not only in community levels, you find it at an organism level. You go down, you find this interconnectedness in right all the way to the nucleus, to the DNA. So this is just an, an, a study about a, a scientist who looked at these interconnectedness and the regulatory networks that run um, genomic uh, context of maize. And they found 15 networks that were almost fully connected with each other with hundreds of genes involved. Fully connected means, don't you misunderstand that, that even if you go here, you change one gene here, or you change a gene here or here, it will, the question is not if it will have an impact, it has. Fully connected means it will impact the entire system. The question is only how and to what significant degree will this change something that we can perceive it, measure it, see it, and it manifests itself into something phenotypically or behaviorally that we can measure, but it will. So that is out of the question, it will. We found, I just looked around uh, this morning in preparation to hear if I find something on, on one of the traits that have been, by the way, promised since 40 years uh, to adapt plans. So when it comes to the to the traits they are trying to manipulate, as the previous speaker was listing the plant traits, I haven't seen a trait there that has not been claimed to be uh, on the list of traits they wanted to change with all genetic engineering tools ever invented. So abiotic stress, adaptation to a changing environment, climate change, all that was high on the top of the list already in the 90s and in the 80s when the first tools of genetic engineering were out, but they haven't delivered. And the question is now what I'm missing is that there is no critical scrutiny behind why haven't they delivered and what kept them from delivering and what, how and to what degree will the newer tools overcome those hurdles that stop the first ge genetic engineering ones from delivering the products? Because it is my firm belief and that of my colleagues that what stopped them to deliver is exactly the lack of understanding of that genomic context that I was trying about. This is just a publication 2017 where scientists went through the pains and studied the complex quantitative traits and their interconnectedness again. So I'm emphasizing the regulatory and the interconnectedness of it that underlies drought response just in maize. And they found in a very complicated paper, I must admit, um, that 144 highly connected genes are involved when you are subjecting a plant to different types of drought stress. 
there's many different types in many different states of the plant composed of many different um, um, reasons and abiotic factors so these we're talking always hundreds of plants quantitatively regulated that if you do that tiny little intervention that you are promoting there you will first of all have no chance that you will um, have that trait with just some limited interventions that this technique can they are restricted to point mutations and no matter how many point mutations you can add linearly you will not simulate a quantitative interconnected trait with hundreds of others and therefore it is a technique that has proven to be most efficient and most effective in what it does when you just cut out dna pieces so they speak of deleting sequences okay that's where they have been good but with regard to these kinds of traits that I was just alluding to, the potential for these kinds of genetic engineering is minimal, in my view. So the question to answer when you say, will this happen in these complex traits that have been promised, that applies to other abiotic stress, that applies also to biotic stress, the chances that this will deliver something that is sustainable is minimal. And if you have something that has only a couple of genes in it and provides you with, say, like the BT gene with an insect resistance or a virus resistant, it's usually broken faster than it took you to put it in there. And that is highly unsustainable by definition. All right, I will leave it here and leave you with something where we know that it can deliver and that is being marginalized in this whole debate all the time. That is good old breeding. Breeding has delivered the products over the last decades that genetic engineering was promising to do and hasn't. But here, this is just one of the initiatives. There's by no means this is the only one on breeding drought tolerant maize in, a, in an international effort for drought tolerant maize for Africa and scientists all over uh, Africa in a big, large consortium launched in two, 2006 have delivered by 2009, 50, that's according to CIMIT, that's an international research center and various government organizations, 50 new drought tolerant varieties and hybrids that have been released to farmers already just a few years later. And by 2016, when the project was finished, they had developed 233 maize varieties to be used in various countries. And in addition to that, some of them had also tolerance against striga, tolerance uh, had altered quality, uh, protein quality, and nitrogen use efficiency. If only two of these varieties would have had been developed by using any of these genetic engineering tools, they would have been headline news on every major news outlet in this world. But because they were just developed with good old breeding methods, nobody really took notice of or takes it for granted. And this should be the passing off to my to the next speaker who hopefully will be in the position to explain technologies and approaches to sustainable agriculture that have actually already proven that they work. While genetic engineering still needs to do that, but the funding basis for both is grossly asymmetrical. And that I think needs to change. And um, we need to have a hard look in return on investment. That is, is my final um, plea to, to, the, to the group. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica, for this very comprehensive view, some of it very complex, but also some very, very clear messages about a very potent technology that still has its limitations and what will come out really, uh, we don't know. And especially thank you for introducing indirectly already our next speaker, uh, Sebastian Kussmann. You said good old breeding has delivered. Uh, Sebastian is uh, joining us from Switzerland. Welcome, Sebastian. Um, he is a breeder, a plant breeder, uh, a breeder of grain legumes. Uh, Sebastian works with a non-profit organization that breeds field crops for organic and low input agriculture in Feldbach in Switzerland and in Hesse in Germany, but also in other places in Europe. And Sebastian will introduce his organization, of course. Um, prior to his uh, work uh, for two years now with this organization called uh, Peter Kunz, I, I think, um, he uh, worked in maize and wheat breeding in Germany in a place that some of you may know, which is called Dottenfelderhof. 
Um, and he also did agrobiodiversity research at the University of Central Asia in Tajikistan and at the Agricultural Research Center of the Swiss government, Agroscope. Sebastian holds a degree in organic agriculture and a master in plant breeding, both from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Sebastian, welcome. Your work is all focused on breeding plants that need to, uh, that need no, or, or shall we say, practically no chemical inputs. That's of course the direction that the EU wants to take. So we've got that EU green deal, we've got the farm to fork strategy. This is all about reduction in chemical pesticides, reduction in mineral fertilizers. We want less inputs. So that's where you come in, really. You, that, that's your area of work. So from that perspective of yours, what do you say to the Commission's premise that the new genomic techniques can help to reduce inputs and make farming more sustainable? Even if you don't work with GM plants yourself, do you think such plants have a role to play? Sebastian. Yeah, thanks for your um, introduction and thanks Angelica for the, also for the introduction. Um, I try to share my screen. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, it works. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> you can see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so I unfortunately I do less focus on um, alternatives. It's more that I just uh, give a brief overview what from the perspective of agroecological breeding are the potentials or are the current um, yeah, potentials of the, the new um, GMO techniques for plant breeding. Just to introduce um, the organization I'm working for briefly again, um, we are a non-governmental uh, non nonprofit organization um, and we are um, based in Switzerland, but we also breed in stations in Italy and in Germany. And the goals of our organization is to develop um, diverse field crops, which have a local adaptation to the place where they're actually grown. And we focus on field crops that can be cultivated without chemical inputs which is at the moment mainly organic agriculture, but in the future, hopefully this will be the largest part of the agricultural production system in, the, in Europe. And what we also try is to involve as many stakeholders as possible from the agri-food system already in the breeding process, so that we guarantee that the, that the varieties we are developing are actually at the end accepted by the farmers and by the processors. And we have a strong focus also on uh, minor crops. So we are not just focusing on the big cash crops, but we also want to um, breed crops which have um, only a minor position at the moment in the agricultural production system. So the varieties we are mainly focusing on are wheat, spelt, triticale, emma, pea, lupin, sunflower, and maize. And especially the grain legumes like pea and lupin, they are could be considered as minor crops because they haven't been bred for a long time uh, in Europe. With a, they have, yeah, you can say almost not been developed in the last decades. And our varieties are grown in different, or we sell our seeds in different countries in Europe. So maybe to um, continue a little bit with with uh, what Angelica already said before, I want to. Um, yeah, raise the question or actually what is, what do we really want and what do we need to make agriculture more sustainable instead of asking the question always what is technically possible? Because often I have the feeling from a reading perspective that there are many problems which are caused by the agricultural production system and by the food system, which we try to tackle with plant breeding. So we want to change traits in plants to make them more drought resistant. We want to make plants more um, resistant to ab abiotic stresses. But in fact, these um, needs to make plants more resistant to abiotic stresses or to abiotic stresses are actually coming from the agricultural production system. So in the first step, we always have to ask ourselves, what should we tackle with plant breeding 
and what should actually be um, tackled with the entire agricultural production system. And that's what Angelica already mentioned. We have to ask a question, do we really want to make agriculture more sustainable or do we actually want to stick to the current system? If I look from a plant breeder's perspective, what is currently um, developed with these new techniques, um, then um, I have to say that what has been presented already in um, what has been presented already in the presentation of the commission, what we see is that there are many crops actually which are um, in the research pipeline at the moment. So there is a diverse portfolio of crops where researchers and research institutions try to change trades um, also with for abiotic stresses, for biotic stresses. But if we look at the end, what is in the commercialization, we see only cash crops. So in the marketing pipelines of the big companies, at the end, there are only products which have a strong focus on high income markets in the global north. Just to give you a few examples, what is currently in the pipeline, there's, for example, a, in the pipeline, a high fiber wheat from Calix company, which tries to have higher fiber content in the grain to make wheat more um, healthy. This is something which is only a problem in like the global north where too much wheat is actually consumed. And you can, for example, also use whole grain products. You don't have to put the, the fiber into the grain. Actually, if you polish it before and you remove the fiber and then you put the fiber back into the grain so that the bread at the end becomes more healthy. Doesn't make sense for, from my perspective. Or for example, uh, and the pairwise company is working on the cherry without a stone and there is huge investment in such products. But if I, if I compared with the goals that have been presented in the study of the commission, then I clearly have to say, okay, what we find at the end in the, in the commercialization is not what has been the initial goal in the research, in the basic research. And this especially um, is valid for the number of, or for the variety of plants. Like in the basic research, we have a lot of minor crops, but at the end, we only have the main cash crops which come to the market. Um, if I look at the goal to reduce fertilizers and pesticides use, I also have to say, uh, we have to say that's not true. Most of the um, products which are coming from, most of the products which are also produced with the new genomic editing techniques, um, focus on pesticide and herbicide tolerance. And this is only to reduce labor costs. So it is not to make agriculture more sustainable. It is not to have better yields or better composition of substances in the product. It is only to reduce labor costs. And also if I, what I said before Randy is increasing agrodiversity, we have to say it's not true actually because in the basic research, yes, there is a focus on agrobiodiversity, also on minor crops to make them more suitable for agricultural production. But at the end, we only see that there are major crops developed and there's still a huge investment needed to um, develop a product, a new variety with um, the new genome editing techniques. And if I see this, then I have to also realize that there is a huge investment in this, which makes it for companies important to actually at the end sell the product that it is grown on a bigger, um, bigger area, which means that companies which are focusing on the new um, genomic techniques in breeding, they also have to make a return of investment. That's why I think it is, we can say that it's um, likely that even less uh, feed crops are bred and developed. And at the end, the accessibility, there are so many patents involved at the moment into the new breeding techniques that we can say that for especially small breeding companies, it will not be possible to um, use and apply these techniques because it's, the, it's um, too much work actually to 
go through all the patents and to identify what patents are involved. And that's not possible for small breeding companies. They won't have the capacity. So the question is actually, what kind of brand breeding really has the potential to contribute to the sustainable development of European agriculture? We have in the last um, decades, actually two directions in plant breeding. One is biotechnology and the other one is agroecology or ecological plant breeding. And we have a huge, um, yeah, like the biotechnology is quite, the, it's the biggest part actually of the breeding at the moment concerning investment into research and especially into public research funding. And this leads to kind of a bias that at the moment, we have the feeling that only biotechnology is actually plant breeding. But in the last decades, we also had huge research in ecology and in mechanisms that happen in the field between plants. And this is actually not at all reflected in the current plant breeding systems, especially in huge uh, companies. And I want to give an example for this. Um, there's a huge project going on at the moment where many companies are involved in Germany, especially, which is called Pilton. And the project tries with biotechnology to make wheat resistant to fungal diseases. As you see there in the slide, the method which is used is CRISPR, which is one of the main new breeding techniques and main GMO techniques. And what I want to do is they want to silence, or what they already did is they silence a gene in the plant which produces, um, which stops the production against, um, the, stops the production of a substance in the plant which is fighting um, against fungus. So what happens is um, if a fungus is attacking a plant, the plant st starts a reaction against the fungus, a mechanism which stops the fungus. And when, the, and when it successfully managed to destroy the fungus, then it stops this process again. You can compare it, for example, with fever. If you have a disease and you have fever, then the body uh, starts um, he, um, heating up. And if the, when the disease is over, it cools down again. So what they want to do is, or what they did already is to stop stopping this process so that the, per, the plant is permanently fighting against the fungus and does not stop um, this mechanism, this tolerance mechanism against the fungus. Why is this from an agroecological perspective problematic, such an intervention into the plant genome? Because one thing is focus only on one tolerance mechanisms. That means if I have many plants in a huge field or in a huge area of Europe, for example, only, which all have this trait, then it is quite likely that a fungus overcomes this tolerance mechanisms. And then I have a huge problem because if I only have this tolerance mechanism in all the plants there, then I can have, it's quite likely that I develop a kind of a super fungi, which can attack all the plants. And what is most problematic like from my perspective, from an agroecological breeding perspective is there are many in positive interactions between fungi and plants. For example, we talked about, Angelica talked about uh, uh, heat tolerance before. There is, for example, an interaction between a fungus in the soil and a plant. Fungus have kind of roots and they are much smaller than plant roots. So what they do is they can access water in the soil, which is not accessible for the plant. If the plant is in a symbiosis with the fungus, it can access water, which is not available for the plant from, with its own roots. So, but when I have a plant which is permanently fighting against fungi, then it can also not go into the symbiosis with the beneficial fungi. And this is a huge problem with, if I only consider always a single plant and I want to put all the traits into this one plant. And what I do not consider is actually how this plant interacts in the specific environment. So what would be alternative approaches from agroecological breeding. One thing is that we should definitely not focus on only one resistance or tolerance mechanism, but we should focus on plants with different 
tolerance and resistance mechanisms which are in agricultural production so that we have a bench of diverse of um, diverse varieties which are grown in one spot so if one variety for example is diseased by a fungus that we have other varieties which can be grown instead and we always have to include the preventive measurements in cultivation so the actual production has to be considered in the uh, tolerance and resistance management so what we have as alternatives is from agroecological breeding that we grow heterogeneous varieties which are actually not consist of only one genotype with such only one resistance but we grow different um, genotypes with different resistance mechanisms in one field which you can see in the right hand picture and that we can also mix different crops which are actually adapted to the cultivation and mixture so that we actually reduce the hosts for the for the fungus in this case so that uh, the fungus is not able to destroy the harvest on the entire field and that's what you can also see here in this picture for example if you grow different field crops in one field so just to give a few conclusions the current breeding goals um, they are actually not in line often with the sustainable development goals for example the green deal or the form to uh, farm to fork storage uh, objectives of the european union and we have a uh, huge imbalance between actually agroecological breeding and biotechnology based breeding so we should promote agroecological breeding and the deregulation of GM plants would massively restrict the exchange of genetic material because if there are patents involved into certain varieties, then we cannot use them anymore as breeders. And for us, it is really, really, really important that we have access for our breeding programs to all the genetic material which has been bred in the last decades and by different companies. And yeah, the access to technologies is highly restricted due to patents and like small breeding companies like we we cannot deal the efforts which are um, which actually evolve with the uh, patent issues thank you Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you for that, for that overview and also the examples that, that illustrate really what is done with biotechnology, what is done in an alternative system that, that takes care of all these different relationships that um, Angelica has also outlined. Unfortunately, I cannot ask you any more questions because we're massively over time. So I do have another two speakers who would like to, to talk to us and who have really interesting things to say. Both of them are joining us from across the Atlantic. Uh, where it's now early morning hours. They basically live and work in countries where there aren't any strict GMO regulations that would hamper the development and marketing of GM plants. That is in Canada and in the US. So in the words of the commission, places where farmers and society at large can already reap the benefits of this type of innovation. So we have invited those speakers to hear whether there is anything to learn from these countries. In principle, the regulatory regimes there should have made it possible to see that those new GM products, you know, emerge that, that contribute to sustainability. So let's see whether it's worth the EU following in their footsteps to promote more sustainable farming. First to Cameron Goff, who's joining us from Saskatchewan in Canada. Welcome, Cameron. Great, you can join us. Um, a few words here about Cameron. Uh, he is a conventional farmer who crops about 1,600 hectares or 4,000 acres with canola, barley, wheat, oats, flax, and peas. Cam is a member of Canada's National Farmers Union and served on its executive for a couple of years the National Farmers Union, which I'm sure you're going to talk about a little bit, promotes the family farm as the most appropriate means of agricultural production and aims for agroecology and food sovereignty. Uh, the union is a founding member of La Via Campesina, the global movement that brings together organizations representing small and medium scale farmers, peasants, agricultural workers, rural women and indigenous communities. So, Cam, you've been 
farming since 1975, I heard. So you've seen the advent of GM crops in Canada. You're actually growing GM varieties yourself. Uh, so what has been the experience with GM plants in Canada? And um, how has the seed offer developed? You know, what's been the impact on prices, uh, on non-GMO farming, on the organic sector? You know, just, just, just tell us what that experience has been and whether there has been, shall we say, a, a, an, an environment that enables more sustainability. Over to you. Okay. Well, thanks, Francesca. Uh, I'll just say a little bit more about the NFU and myself uh, to give a bit more background. But as Francesca said, and National Farmers Union is a voluntary direct membership organization across Canada. Thousands of families produce basically if an agricultural product is produced in Canada. There is likely a member of the NFU involved in doing so. Uh, we've just turned 52 years old. And we advocate for the right of people to produce and consume healthy food produced in an ecologically sound and sustainable method, and also for the rights of citizens and farmers to define their own food and agriculture system. Uh, we, are, we articulate the interests of Canada's family farms and propose solutions that benefit all Canadians. Now, I grew up on a family farm in South Central Saskatchewan, which is in Western Canada, and Saskatchewan has the largest acreage of farmland in Canada. It's in the northern part of the American, North American Great Plains, and it shares broad similarities to much of the farmland in uh, the central United States. I did start farming my own land in 1975, and I continued to work with my two brothers on a grain operation that grows mostly wheat, barley, canola, and flax, with a mixture of other minor crops. Uh, we're considered conventional farmers in that we use zero till direct seeding along with fertilizers and pesticides. Now, like most Canadian farmers, we now grow GMA, GMO canola, which has been the case for over 20 years now. Now, this is a direct result of government policies. Uh, as many of you know, canola is a crop that was uh, developed in Canada in the 1960s at the University of Saskatchewan, which is only 60 kilometers from my farm, uh, using public money. Now, after decades of publicly funded research, breeding, development, uh, the government made the decision to turn the crop over to private industry. Over time, the major life science companies such as Bayer, Monsanto, and BASF have developed a stranglehold on the crop and basically exert almost complete control over it. Now, beginning in the 1990s and coinciding with the development of hybrid canolas, uh, the major companies introduced the GMO-enabled herbicide tolerance into the traits, uh, the traits of their, into their varieties. Monsanto used glyphosate and uh, Bayer used glufosinate uh, or Liberty to, uh, as a herbicide, uh, herbicides of choice. Now, as on our farm, we resisted this trend as long as it was economically feasible. We bought non-GMO hybrids, which had superior yield to the GMO hot varieties until the company stopped selling those non-GMO hybrids. Now, the reason they did this was because at the time they were developing the hybrids and then they were taking the hybrid they developed, inserting the gene uh, for Roundup or, or Liberty, and then reintroducing that uh, variety to, uh, for public uh, consumption, which meant they were always several years behind the non-GMO hybrids in yield. So when they actually realized what they were doing and why they were falling behind, they stopped releasing the conventional uh, hybrids. So all you had available to you was GMO varieties. So <clears throat> something you should realize is that while life science companies have always claimed that the major yield increases in canola yield over this period of GMO and hybrid introduction was due to the GMO effect, where in reality, it was the hybridization technology that led to most of the higher yield. Now, since then, uh, oh, so what does GMO technology meant to Canadian farmers? Well, there's been a lot of changes over the last two decades. First, farmers no longer have their own canola seed cleaned and treated. 
we used to take our canola that we'd grown down to uh, a local farm. They would clean it. They'd treat it with um, sometimes an insecticide and, and uh, a disease uh, preventative seed treatment, bag it, <clears throat> we'd go and pick it up. Then uh, the suppliers of the seed treatment, which were Bayer, Monsanto, uh, stopped selling uh, small, uh, friendly, if you will, size containers to these people, uh, so they couldn't treat the seed. So at that point, we took our seed to these people to get treated, then we had to truck it uh, several hundred kilometers to a, a plant that would actually treat it, bag it, and pick it up. So a lot more work. And then the seed, the life science company stopped selling the seed treatment to those larger seed treating plants. So therefore, basically, you were <clears throat> treating your own seed was almost impossible. Um, and what that meant basically was at the time when we started to uh, take our seed to these small cleaners where they do everything for you, our cost was about $10 an acre to sow canola. Uh, by the time they had finished uh, you know, preventing you from doing that, the cost was about $25 to $30 per acre. And now the current cost of seeding canola strictly for the seed is between 50 and 70 dollars uh, per acre so uh, not uh, not cheap anymore <clears throat> now another thing is companies such as Bayer and Monsanto basically uh, give 90 percent of the canola seed earnings to their shareholders and only put about 10 percent back into research uh, meanwhile the Canadian government uh, is still putting millions of dollars into what they call upstream canola research and whatever uh, disease uh, tolerance, et cetera, that they come up with, they then hand over to the major companies to commercialize and charge farmers. <clears throat> uh, now seed is widely available in the countryside. You can buy it from grain companies, independent retailers, corporate representatives, but the prices are really only range in a very narrow band. Uh, and there was a time when there were actually dozens of new varieties every year, which made it pretty tough for a farmer to decide what variety to grow. You had so many new ones plus the ones you were used to. Uh, and then actually the companies realized that they were, well, there were a lot of companies into it back then. Uh, but as the number of companies <clears throat> shrunk, they realized that, you know, they were shooting themselves in the foot, doing a lot of extra work, costing themselves money. So now there's only about, 10 new varieties uh, really registered every year in Canada. And uh, a lot of that has to do with Canada's uh, the varietal development system and the way we actually uh, allow new varieties to be uh, put on the market, which is too complicated to get into, but that's part of the reason as well. And another thing that happened uh, very shortly after the major companies took over, if you will, the canola industry, uh, most of you have probably heard about Percy Schmeiser, a Canadian farmer who basically cleaned and resealed, uh, reseeded his own canola over a space of years, trying to develop uh, a, uh, a locally grown, locally adapted variety. Now, Monsanto heard he was uh, his stuff that he was seeding and, cl and clean, or cleaning and seeding was Roundup ready, and he was therefore infringing on their patent. So he uh, took them to court, or they took him to court, sorry. And uh, Schmeiser claimed that any Roundup ready canola that was in his field had either blown in off of the highway, which was located to his, uh, located at the side of the field from trucks going untarped past his field, seed blowing off and blowing into his, into his field, or else it had outcrossed from uh, genetic varieties which were grown by his neighbors. Now, when it went to court, eventually, after several years, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada ruled that regardless of how that Roundup Ready trait had uh, come into uh, Percy Schmeiser's land, uh, he was responsible for infringing on the patent because the canola he was growing was Roundup Ready, and therefore he was legally and financially liable, uh, which, of course, was uh, very uh, devastating to uh, not only to him, 
but also to other farmers because immediately after that farmer cleaning of seed, which was still occurring uh, somewhat at that time, basically disappeared completely. People, it wasn't worth the, <clears throat> the fear factor, if you will. Another thing that's happened is there's almost no organic cano canola grown in Western Canada now because GMO contamination is inevitable. There is so much grown everywhere. Uh, the cross flow of pollen is going to show up uh, when that canola is tested to see if it's organic, regardless of how careful the organic grower has been. So it's almost non-existent in Western Canada. Eastern Canada, where they don't grow as much canola, uh, organic growers can get away with it, but, but not in Western Canada. And something we have to keep in mind is that scientists and the companies uh, claimed at first that GMO canola pollen would never outcross the other canola. Uh, but they were proven wrong, basically, when canola plants were found in Canada that were resistant to multiple herbicides. So they were finding canola plants in fields of Roundup that were resistant to, uh, to Liberty and vice versa. And the only way that could have happened was from the, the cross flow of genes due to, uh, to pollination. And it, it's important to remember that one of the uh, arguments that Monsanto had against Percy, Percy Schmeiser was they had scientists, the scientists actually who developed canola in, uh, in, at the University of Saskatchewan, swore in court that that could never happen. You could never have uh, pollination outcross of traits. And yet, 10, 10 years later, there it was. Uh, another thing that happened in regards to, to my mind, because companies were, were in control of, uh, of the canola market, was shortly, oh, I'm not sure when it was, it would have been probably in the, sometime in the 1980s, uh, Canadian scientists uh, under public, their, the public plant breeding developed a GMO trait for what we called hairy canola. Uh, canola um, relatives such as mustard have very fine hairs all over the plant on the stem and on the leaves that deter pests from eating them. And in Canada, there's a, a serious problem with a, an insect called flea beetles, which uh, show up shortly after canola is seeded and they chow down on the canola plants and can actually totally decimate a field or, or uh, certainly damage large areas of it. And this uh, trait of a, of a hairy canola would really reduce that, that damage greatly. And, uh, so they offered it to the companies, uh, said, look, here, here's this great trait. Uh, you won't have to put seed treatment on any longer and insecticide seed treatment. And the company said, well, yeah, but we won't be able to put insecticide treatment on any longer. So why would we want to do that? So they didn't. It, that trait has been around for 20 years. Uh, well, no, now it's, I guess it's probably close to 30 or 40 years and nobody's going to touch it because they can't make the money off of it that they can by selling insecticidal seed treatments. So uh, that's not, so that's the sort of thing you have to worry about. You, you know, it just points out the danger of company monopolies. They want two things. They want power and they want profit. And I mean, nobody should be surprised because they are a, a money-making enterprise. That's why they exist. They provide products and people pay for them. Uh, but you can be sure that one hand always knows what the other one's doing and they work together to maximize their profit, regardless of what it means to, uh, in my opinion, regardless of what it means to uh, society as a whole. Another I think I think that's really important to point out is trip and flax, which I think once again, a lot of people in in Europe are at least partly familiar with. It was a, once again, it was a, a breed that was developed at the University of Saskatchewan, and it was supposed to be tolerant. It was tolerant to group two pesticides, uh, but it was never commercially released because there was a, a, a great concern that uh, we'd lose customers if we had a gen genetically modified flax grown in Canada, even if we tried to keep it uh, separate uh, in the commercial collection and, and shipping part of it. So anyway, uh, lo and behold, about uh, 10 years or more after this uh, Triffid flax was basically never released, just stayed at the university, 
the EU started to find it in shipments of flax from Canada. And everybody here was totally baffled by how this could have happened. They thought somebody must have got some and grown it. And then over the years, it just somehow uh, shifted around all over Western Canada because this problem was, was everywhere in the country. And eventually and we they... Need to, we, we, we need to wrap up. Okay, well, eventually they found out that it had escaped at the university and uh, that's where the contamination had occurred. It was, it was in all of the, the flax breeding lines that the university was uh, developing. So lots of unknown dangers posed by new technology. So thanks. Thanks, Cam. I think that was very clear and, and a very interesting uh, account of uh, a corporate takeover, you know, like basically... Uh, some companies taking over the canola industry in in, uh, in Canada also via their GMO crops. I think that's a very, very interesting example. And there's probably lots of questions to you, but this is the worst webinar ever that I have moderated because I let every speaker go over time. And we only have time for one more speaker. We won't really have time for discussion. And I apologize for that already. But with that, I would like to introduce Linda Cognato, Linda is joining us from the state of Washington in the northwest of the US. Welcome, Linda, and great to have you with us. Um, Linda, I will just say a few words. You're a research analyst for the Non-GMO Project, which you will introduce. Uh, Linda is responsible for monitoring all forms of genetic modification and their products from development through to com commercialization, helping to maintain the project's non-GMO verification standard. You will say more about the GMO project and the label. I just want to say it is one of the most, the fastest growing labels in the retail sector in the US, so very successful. Uh, Linda joined the project in 2016 and had worked on a range of environmental projects uh, prior to that as an editor, as a writer. And here's my question, so we get on with it. Um, Linda, you have been monitoring GM technologies and their products, and in particular the new GM technologies, um, ranging from the microorganisms to the plants and animals. What is it that you do see coming to the market in the US where most of these appear to be deregulated? Do you see plants come through that will contribute to sustainability in one way or another? And is it possible to tell, you know, when, when is it GM and, and when is it? not because we've we've had that discussion here so over to you linda thank you very much and also um thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion i'm going to share my screen quickly and let me that works all right can you see that excellent okay um as, as I was introduced, yes, I am the research analyst for the Non-GMO Project. We're located in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And um, the Non-GMO Project is an independent nonprofit organization um, dedicated to preserving a non-GMO food supply through its rigorous non-GMO verification standard. Um, and then also just to say that a lot of the reason for our existence is the fact that the US government provides limited oversight of um, traditional GMOs and almost no oversight of crops or products of new GMO techniques. Um, and we do have a new labeling law, um, which was implemented and will go into full effect in January of um, 2022. Um, it is referred to, it is called the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard or MBFDS. Um, however, it is inconsistent and provides limited insight into genetically modified products, ingredients, and inputs. Um, and so even in terms of labeling, um, American consumers have very little insight into what's actually in their food. Um, and I should also mention at this point that sustainability as a collective issue or goal is relatively new in the US. And so we have individual um, consumer groups and groups of smaller farmers and some corporations that are just now beginning to look at sustainability 
availability as an issue, but to this point, it ha really has not been a topic of conversation on any major in any major way. So just a little history about the non-GMO project. It was founded in 2007, uh, specifically to address the desire of consumers to avoid GMOs. And again, in response to the fact that um, many of these crops and products were not tightly regulated by the United States government, and there was no labeling to indicate where these were present in their food. Um, it was started by two natural grocery store chains that were getting so many requests by their consumers that they decided to join forces and thus the non-GMO project was born. The UNPAC non-GMO project verification mark was launched in uh, 2010, and that was after the creation of our verification standard. Um, the project, just to clarify, the project's definition of GMO is based on and aligns with the Cartagena protocol, um, so the definition that is used there. Um, since our founding um, and the um, premiere of the UNPAC label, the number of project verified products has grown from um, approximately 750 in the first year in 2010 to over uh, 62,000 at the present time. Um, individual products that carry our verification seal. Um, consumer recognition of the non-GMO project verification label, uh, which is 54%, is second only to that for the certified organic label at 63%. Currently, the project is monitoring over 460 developers of genetically modified and genetically engineered crops and products, and we have a list of um, approximately of 120 products or crops of genetic modification engineering that we are actively monitoring. And I will say that that includes also, um, when I say products, it also includes animals as well as um, products of what we refer to here as synthetic biology, which is the genetic modification of microorganisms. And also, I should mention that when I say 120 crops, those are individual crops. So for example, for corn, we might have, uh, let's say, 100 different events, genetically modified events, specifically just for corn. Um, so we're also looking at all of those individual events. So as you probably are well aware of, uh, traditional GMOs dominate commodity crops in the United States. So these are just some examples of um, corn, cotton, soybeans, sugar beets, and canola uh, rapeseed, which are all well over 90% in terms of their dominance of US agriculture. Um, for those uh, crop types. Um, we also have um, five new um, crops, five new GMO technique crops that have been commercialized in the United States. And that includes the Arctic apple, two varieties, uh, the Simplot innate potato, the Del Monte pink, pink glow pineapple, which is a pink flesh as opposed to a yellow flesh. Um, calyx, hyaleic soy, and Cebus su canola. Now, the first three have been produced using RNA interference. Um, calyx was produced, obviously, as you know, using um, talon, and Cebus su canola was produced using their proprietary RTDS um, technique, which is based on ODM. So I just wanted to provide some observations of what we are seeing here in the United States, both in terms of um, long term, in terms of um, traditional GMOs, but also in terms of the development of new crops and products using these new GMO techniques. So first I'll say that no new GMO crops commercialized in the U.S. to date have made sustainability claims. We are now just seeing sustainability claims pop up for specific developers, and I think a lot of that has to do with the international climate of sustainability and certainly of climate change becoming a more important issue. And so we're not just now seeing some of those companies shift to making claims of sustainability, both on their websites and in press. Um, we also know that without regulation, monitoring and or labeling, transparency is at, in the best case at risk 
or in the worst case is completely lost. So consumers will have no, um, no idea what's actually in their food or in the products that they buy. Um, we have seen no empirical evidence to validate any new GMO sustainability claims. So most of these claims are, are primarily theoretical. And so we have no empirical evidence to back that up. Um, development traits and pipelines and timelines are continuously shifting. And this relates in part to this new interest in sustainability and climate health or climate change and um, soil health, where we see companies shift the types of crops that they're turning their attention toward, as well as what they have in their trial pipeline and the, type line, the timelines in terms of when those crops might potentially be commercialized. Um, we see that companies promote strategies that serve their financial goals. So they will um, clearly um, promote their crop in a way that makes it most um, financially beneficial to them. And that includes for a number of crops we have seen make non-GMO claims. And those are based in part on the fact that they have been considered to be non-regulated by the US government, as well as the fact that they are not transgenic. And so they use those as a rationale in order to promote their crops as non-GMO. We have also seen instances where crops have been promoted to both farmers and to the public as non-GMO. But when we look at some paperwork, such as their IPO filings for initial public offering with the Security and Exchange Commission, in terms in terms of making statements to potential investors, they have clearly identified their crops as being the product of genetic modification. So that has been an interesting dichotomy. Um, based on historical data, there is a tendency to overpromise. So they will basically make promises that when the crops are actually released and commercialized, we see that they cannot fulfill those promises. Um, it is difficult to conduct and achieve unbiased assessments. So whenever an assessment is conducted, whether that's of an individual specific crop um, in terms of safety or in terms of um, just assessments in general for the environment, um, there is rarely a case where those assessments are non-biased. Um, they definitely, there, many of them are conducted by the individual developers, and so if there's an inherent bias included in those assessments. It is uncertain to what extent non-HT um, herbicide tolerant and non-BT or um, insect resistant traits will be marketable without incentives. So one of the things that we're seeing here is that some of the new crops, um, for example, we know that um, there have been articles written about the fact that one of the issues with Calyx HO canola was the fact that the yield was relatively low. And so um, it was not as successful as initially um, projected. Um, so it'll be interesting to see to what extent certain traits will be marketed without um, incentives in order to grow those crops um, on the part of the developers. Um, we have been promised through the use of new um, techniques such as Talon and CRISPR, radically streamlined paths from development to commercialization. And we have seen, or we are seeing that those haven't really materialized. We have a number of crops that have been promised for commercialization um, on numerous occasions, and, none, and, and in, in a number of cases, those have not come to fruition. And so we're still seeing long lead times from the time of development through um, trials, through testing, and um, commercialization. Um, and I might note that both Calyx and Cebus have recently changed course in terms of their marketing strategies. Calyx sold the remainder of its high oleic soy to ADM. And that was after it had um, actually processed and sold the high oleic soy on its own. Um, but it was determined um, at least 
anecdotally, it's been determined that it wasn't profitable for them. So they sold the remainder to ADM, Arthur Daniels Midland, and SEBA sold its SU Canola seed breeding program to the Farmers Business Network. And, you know, one of the questions that I have in that is, is this an effort to um, potentially rebrand Seabus Canola? Um, you may or may not know that in, I believe it was in early 2019, Seabus created a subsidiary company called the Falco Seed Company, and that was um, purposely set up to actually market their um, canola seed. And so it's interesting that now that Falco is no longer in existence and the whole seed breeding program has been now um, sold to Farmers Business Network. Um, so, and they have announced that they likely will not have their hybrids available for between one to three years. So there will be an obvious delay in the seed being available. So um, those are the observations that I have, and I should mention that these observations in no particular order. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. This is such a wealth of information and so many new facts that we all have to take in. And I really, really apologize for having, you know, let the space for all the long presentations, which I think were very, very interesting, but don't leave us any time for discussion. And even the questions that you've put in, we won't be able to, to process because we're already over time. We're already 1734 in my computer screen. So all I can do is promise that we will put all the presentations that the speakers are fine with sharing on our web page and share those presentations with you. We will also have a recording uh, of this webinar, which will be available to you. Um, we cannot discuss back and forth, but hopefully we'll be in touch again. Uh, we will have more meetings and we will have better meetings that allow space for discussion. And with this, I go to Martin, Martin Häusling, who will have a closing remark. Martin. From all of this, what is it that you take away and that you want others to take away as well from this meeting? Thank you very much. I believe that we have received a lot of new and important information to continue with our debate. In other words, there is a scientific debate regarding risk assessment related to GMO and NGTs. And I believe that Angelika Hilbeck has explained very well that things are not as easy as some claim. And it is not just cutting a bit off the genome and you create new plants and you can grow them. Things are not that easy. And the developers of these technologies are very critical towards the technologies themselves. However, in Europe, we have a very strict legislation and we are now in a situation in which can we actually say okay let's give up part of this legislation for certain gmos i mean in the countries where gmos have been supported have more problems than we have as our canadian colleague has explained and as the american examples have shown, especially if we think about those farmers who can no longer manage their own seeds. That's a very serious situation. So let me state this once more, and I will state this in front of the Commission. We do not only need a better risk assessment, but we need better labels as well. We've heard this from several speakers. If we don't do that, consumers and farmers biological farmers especially, will be negatively impacted by this. So how can organic farmers defend themselves? I mean, if they buy a bag of seeds and they do not know what it is. So we need very clear labels to reach our targets of sustainability. Maybe I am repeating this, but I believe that the Commission 
with the new legal framework is going down a very dangerous way. Jeopardizing our cautionary principle. And we need to state that even if the Commission is trying to neglect this aspect. So if we just check the product and not uh, without checking the production technique, we are clashing against the fundamental documents of the European Union. We need to stop this process. And we need to make a clear cut distinction from vaccines because people now claim that these are the very same technologies used for the COVID vaccine, but these are two separate things. And we shouldn't create confusion in this respect. Genetically modified plants are released in the environment. And this is something completely different from medical and pharmacological experiments carried out in a closed environment. So this kind of comparison is totally ungrounded. And the two technologies are completely different. The two fields are totally different. Yesterday, we had Mr. Fjordsek as our guest in our agricultural board meeting. And I was really surprised by the myths we have heard of fighting climate change by means of GMO plants, because the larger roots allow for greater storage of CO2. Well, I believe that there are such fibs around. I don't believe in these myths. And maybe these are the very same myths they were telling us 20 years ago with the techniques that were developed at that time. And also 20 years ago, we realized that results were not convincing. So we have already made this kind of experience. We do not want to repeat this experience. Therefore, we have to stop. We have to halt this process. And we need to think about the European consumers because they have replied in our questionnaires that they do not want genetically modified food. We need to take their opinion into due consideration. And therefore, our regulations must be strict as far as GMOs are concerned. Why should we allow the patent legislation to be more important than the seed legislation? Why should we relinquish our rights to the advantage of large companies. Having said this, I would like to thank everybody, in particular the speakers. Unfortunately, we have no time to answer the questions, but I promise to you this is the not the last meeting of this kind and on this topic. And next time we will give you the opportunity to participate actively and ask your questions. Until then, we will go on in our fight and we will try to persuade as many people as possible of the fact that the Commission is going the wrong way. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Martin. For this political perspective, we have reached the end of the webinar. We're slightly over time. Thank you all for your participation. Thanks to all our viewers. Thanks to all those who asked questions, who also asked questions that didn't get asked and didn't get an answer. Thank you to all our distinguished panelists for their very interesting contributions. And thank you also to our interpreters for, you know, holding full for translating into German, translating into French simultaneously, and then also into English. Uh, when Martin was speaking, goodbye and have a nice evening and see you next time.